Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, guys. <laughs> Welcome oh. to day three of EscarpCon. Um, if you're tuning in right now, you are tuning into uh, the talk, No Lab, No Problem. Um, I am going to introduce Alex, and then he's going to take, take it over. So Alex, uh, he holds a master's in biotechnology from the University of Guelph. Uh, currently, he is our business development and project coordinator. Uh, he also is a member of the MBAA Ontario Technical Committee. Um, Alex has done a lot for Escarpment Labs in the two plus years that he's been here. Uh, he has spearheaded various projects within the company, including the development of the external quality control department. Uh, and uh, he's also developed a hands-on quality control course for brewers. Um, as well as several marketing and regulatory compliance projects. Um, he is our resident PCR expert. Uh, I've been learning many things from Alex in the few, last few months, um, and he's been fantastic. So, but today we're not going to talk about PCR, so don't, so stay no. with us. <laughs> we're talking about very rudimentary tests that you can, that anyone can do. Um, so without further ado, I hand it off to you, Alex. All right. Well, thanks, Louisa. That was like very kind. <laughs> Too much. Uh, yeah. Hi, guys. Um, so yeah, today we're going to go into no labs, no problems. So I'll get that all queued up on here. Uh, Louisa, if you can confirm that that looks OK. Looks good. Because I can't you're, see anybody. You're okay. not uh, you're not full screen right now, though. You're there you go. What do you mean? This is full screen? No, you're good. You're good. Keep this going. is good or no? <laughs> yeah, you're good. OK, I was like, what? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so we're good? Yeah? Yep, good. All right. So we'll get started on No Lab, No Problem. Um, as everyone knows, uh, by now, hopefully, we are Escarpment Labs. We are a Canadian yeast supplier offering fresh, locally made, and ready to pitch liquid yeast to craft brewers. Uh, we also provide a wide range of services, including microbiological quality control, custom yeast and bacteria development, and strain banking. Um, Part of our core um, beliefs as a company or core set of values is to improve quality and education in the brewing industry, um, which is sort of why we have launched this webinar series. Uh, and this is day three of that. Um, so as Louisa mentioned, I'm Alex. Uh, I have an MSc in biotech. Um, I used to run the external quality control department, but now I do a little bit of business development and project management instead. I do love any crispy and crushable beer. Um, I also do have a uh, soft spot for some fruited sour beers as well. Coors Light, it's my bro. I love that stuff. <laughs> and a full disclaimer uh, before we even get started, I am not a brewer. Um, I have brewed a handful of times on the Escarpment Labs homebrew systems, but that's, that's it. So um, I am really not great for answering any sort of technical questions you have, but um, I do do some of these tests or most of these tests on a regular basis. So uh, the reason we put this webinar together in particular is because we're often asked, uh, do I need to have a lab? Uh, why should I have a lab? Or what does having a lab even mean? Or um, what constitutes a lab? So our answer is always yes, you should have a lab in your brewery. But we understand that that's not always a reality or uh, feasible, especially financially um, and sometimes physically even, like somewhere to put a lab. Um, but hopefully, we will provide some insight into tests you can do with some equipment you have already laying around the brewery. Um, we will, and we do, and I do too, advocate to have a small lab. Uh, you'll hear me say that a few times throughout this course uh, or this presentation. Um, and it, it really just helps you um, improve the quality and con consistently check the quality of your ingredients and your products. Um, it's important, especially if your brewery uses multiple yeasts, including diastatic strains or especially diastatic strains. Uh, if you're packaging unfiltered beer, and especially if you're exporting, especially with the new uh, increases in traceability um, and product monitoring, if you're internationally exporting, there's a lot more paperwork and a lot more traceability that needs to go into that usually. So um, having a lab to have more capabilities um, and access to tests it is better to be to stand behind your product. Um, and throughout the, the course, I will also be talking about a small lab. What I mean for a small lab is not like anything fancy or anything like you know escarpment labs or or having a crazy amount of equipment. I just mean having a microscope and some of the essentials to to plate samples, um, so micro pipettes, some agar, um, that kind of stuff. But we realize many of you don't have a lab, and that's probably why you're tuning in. 
Um, so we will go over some basic tests that you can do um, with equipment you have lying around, hopefully, uh, or cheap equipment you can get. Always remember to document and test any results you perform uh, for that product in a log, database, or binder. This is my personal take home message. So if you take nothing else out of this um, course or this presentation or whatever webinar we're doing, um, that piece of information should be regardless of what you test. Um, as long as you perform a test, you need to record that. If it's an Excel spreadsheet, if it's a scrap piece of paper that you throw into a binder, if it's a product log, um, something. So our agenda today is topic one, tests you can do without having a lab. So forced diacetyl tests, forced fermentations, warm stored sensory, pH monitoring, petri film plating, and forced wort contamination tests. All that can be done with little to no equipment, sort of. Um, and then topic two, uh, additional tests you can do with very basic lab equipment. Um, and we're gonna, I'm gonna use quick bacterial identification as an example to show the power of having basic lab equipment. So let's get started. Topic one, uh, forced diacetyl test. So yesterday, Nate went into diacetyl um, into a full hour long presentation. So if you have additional questions on diacetyl, it's a great resource to use and look up. Uh, I believe it's on our YouTube channel already if you need to uh, reference it, but a quick overview. Uh, it's a butterscotch flavor produced um, by yeast naturally through the fermentation process and it's found in beer. Um, it's acceptable in low doses in some styles, so Czech lagers and English ales typically, um, but most styles, uh, in, uh, including German lagers, it's not. Um, so what makes that butterscotch flavor is specifically when yeast convert glucose to alpha acetolactate. Uh, it needs, the yeast needs this um, precursor to make valine, which is an essential amino acid to perform other regulatory functions within the cell. Uh, however, it makes a lot of it. So it ends up pumping it out of the cell. This gets into your wart. And then since our wart is pretty much a perfect condition, um, it will turn it into diacetyl. So under low pH, oxygen, and high temp, alpha acetolactate gets converted into diacetyl. <clears throat> um, usually it gets uptake or uh, reabsorbed. It gets uh, reabsorbed back into the cell. Um, since the cell needs energy and it's able to convert diacetyl um, eventually into 2,3-butendiol through that whole conversion process, it produces intracellular energy. So eventually the yeast does need it, um, but you need to give the yeast some time to kind of adapt to it and also need it and take it up into the cell. So if you take your beer off of the yeast too quickly, <clears throat> you can't really do anything to reduce that diacetyl off flavor, um, since the only thing that gets rid of it is the yeast itself. Um, so you kind of need to test to see if the diacetyl is still in the wort. Um, so that involves doing a forced diacetyl test, which you usually do when you are done a forced diacetyl rest or a diacetyl rest. Um, now, this is just an example of a diacetyl rest. This is not actually like you need to do this version. Um, this is something that I asked some of our brewers in-house how they would do it. And uh, they just said that you raise the temperature by four or five degrees. Uh, from your fermenting temperature when the beer is 60 to 70 percent done and hold it for three to four days. Typically true for ales, lagers are a little bit more finicky, so something that was suggested to me when I was making a lager was to incre uh, incrementally raise the temperature and hold it for a couple of days at each temperature interval. So yeah, I attempted to make a lager and that was wild, but um, ended up being okay. I fermented at 12 degrees, uh, it was a 1050 wart, uh, when it was around 1020, I raised the temp to 16 degrees, held it for a couple days, then raised it to 20, held it for a couple days. And throughout that, I was checking gravity, monitoring, and then on the fourth day at 20 degrees C, took a sample and did a forced VDK test or forced diacetyl test. Um, so some breweries have fancy, fancy equipment to do this. Uh, so two methods to do that is gas chromatography and spectrophometric analysis. Basically, it can measure the amount of particles and, and actual diacetyl compounds in the wort. Um, it's nice to have, but like no one has these unless you're your macro. <clears throat> we don't have any of that, so we do the same test. Uh, we do um, this super easy sniff test and taste test. So all you do is you grab a couple of mason jars, fill it with your samples, and place them into a water bath at 60 to 70 degrees Celsius. It can be sophisticated water baths you buy online through um, 
scientific equipment companies, or it can be a bucket with HLT water uh, that's cooled down to 80 degrees or less within that 60 to 80 degrees. I wouldn't go higher than 80 degrees just because you can boil off or like flash off some of the volatiles. And that's completely what we're trying to test here <clears throat> to make it sure it's well sealed. Collect your two samples, let one sit for 10 minutes in a water bath while the other one doesn't. Uh, if your water bath is consistent and you know can hold 60 to 70 degrees, you can do 20 minutes, you can do 24 hours, it really doesn't matter. Cool the sample, mix it and shake them, and then compare the smell and the taste of those two uh, samples. And if the treated one still smells like butter or diacetyl, um, you gotta let it sit longer. <clears throat> um, something else to note is you need to make sure that your uh, staff can actually taste or identify diacetyl. Um, if you can't or no one can, this is a completely useless test. You'll never know if your diacetyl has been reabsorbed or not. Um, so it's important to establish a good sensory team that it can identify the taste and kind of identify your best taster or, or sniffer. Um, so a great way to do that is to go to the grocery store, add two to three drops into a can of, uh, we use Coors Light for anything that we do for sensory testing because it's fairly light, um, clear, consistent, um, and have your staff taste it. You can also do a threshold test, so a can with one drop, a can with two drops, a can with three drops, and see who can pick it out at the lowest threshold level. Also, this stuff is great. You can buy this at a grocery store. It's artificial butter flavor. Apparently, it's low calorie, and it's really great for helping to identify that. So our forced fermentations is the second test you can do. This is just to predict the final gravity of what your beer will be. Um, this one's really simple as well. You just collect some wort on your brew day, chill and aerate it, and measure that gravity, then over pitch some of the yeast that you're putting into your brew um, at room temp. Um, the reason you want to over pitch it is to allow the beer to finish faster than the beer that's in tank so that you have a sense of when that final gravity uh, will be achieved. Uh, this can be done on any scale that you have in your brewery. So if you know a 10 liter bucket with a, an airlock is fine or a 25 mil Falcon tube that's pre-sterilized is also fine. Uh, we do them at Escarpment Labs in the 25 mil just because we have um, the DMA 35 uh, from Anton Parr so we can take a smaller sample to check for our gravities. Um, but if you're using a hydrometer, you would want to do a larger scale. Um, and really the, the goal of this is just to achieve gravity quickly. You're not actually going to drink any of this product, um, so you're not really concerned about the taste. Um, so you just want to over pitch your yeast. So 200 mils into 10 liters should be more than enough. But if you have 500 mils, pitch that. Um, doesn't matter. Try to rouse it if you can. Um, yeah. So for that, you're really just over pitching, monitoring your gravity, gravity changes daily, aerate your sample if possible, um, record your data in a lab notebook or, or online in a spreadsheet. If you want to play around with that data, you can generate fermentation curves, uh, curves update that, uh, and then use that if you're continually doing the same product to see kind of how those curves change over time, whether it's your yeast ages or, or whatever you want to do. Um, this brings us to war, warm stored sensory. Uh, it's a great indicator of how your product will behave on the shelf for three months. Um, so what you do is at the end of each run, grab two six packs, put one into a cold room, and put one into a warm room, anywhere it's 25 degrees plus, so probably your boiler room. Um, and then test it weekly. So do a side-by-side -side comparison. Again, I have a sensory panel that you trust uh, and that can do it consistently every week so they know uh, what the product should taste like on an ongoing basis. Um, and honestly, after week two, you should really notice any flavor issues. Um, and after four weeks, you know, you would see diastatic cans exploding if you had that issue as well. So by comparing them, you can see if anything is going to change over the shelf life. And I think, yeah, I think the um, standard rule of thumb is three weeks warm stored is equivalent to three months shelf life on, you know, an LCBO shelf um, if it's not in the fridge. This test is easy, should be done weekly with the same staff members. Uh, and it's basically just to confirm that your product is staying consistent batch to batch as well as um, when stored. Sensory does not have to be complicated. So I did show a radar graph on the side looking at all these different characteristics. It does not have to be that, that crazy. It was just pretty. Um, but all it could be is, you know, at lunch, you crack open the beers, chat about it, record your tasting notes, um, and really you're just seeing if they're consistent or not. 
So this is sort of a tip as well um, when you're doing those sensories to check for your health um, viability or health yeast, yeast health in general. Um, it's kind of gross, but when you order in a pitch, you can actually taste the yeast um, just a little bit, get a sense of what healthy yeast tastes like because that will that flavor will be present in your beer in low amounts. Um, and then take the same sample um, of, of the fresh pitch, heat it up, kill it off, and then taste it. It should taste like Marmite or if, you know, um, if you've ever had like homebrew sitting on, on yeast for way too long and you kind of get that meaty flavor, um, you should be able to detect that as well through the sensory panel and get an idea of your, your yeast health. If you are unable to do plating or cell counts, um, it might be a good indicator that it's time to get a new pitch. Something that's also uh, overlooked as a common test that's super helpful is your pH. Um, every brewery should have a pH meter, I think. If you don't, you can buy these cool litmus paper tests and at least you'll be in the same or the correct range of the pH you want. Um, test every point. Test your mash, your wort, every day of fermentation as it's progressing, pre-filtration, post-filtration, uh, your final packaged beer. Any dramatic pHs, uh, changes in pH could be indications of poor yeast health, um, bacterial contamination, or even um, chemical contamination. So if you notice something dropping from you know, 5.2 to 4.9 overnight, that should be a, a flag for you that something's probably not right. Mash pH is super important, so you should try to aim between 5.2 to 5.5. Um, barley inherently has a lot of phosphates in it, and when that reacts with your water, depending on your water profile, it naturally kind of settles out at 5.6, 5.7, which is pretty much too high for a lot of enzymes to complete uh, sugar conversion. And then downstream, uh, you need a lower pH to help with hop utilization. Um, so you do really want a 5.2 to 5.5 pH um, for your mash. And then once it's collected, you should adjust it to 5.1, 5.2 to help with yeast fermentation. Um, if you notice your pH is increased after you're casting out, it's a good sign that you probably have some sort of chemical residue um, in that vessel. So that'll drastically increase your pH. And if you notice the pH has decreased significantly, um, that could be a sign of bacterial contamination um, and those bacteria are producing organic acids in your beer. So something I came across when kind of putting this together that um, was interesting, I was kind of aware of, but I didn't really realize that it was this great, <laughs> was Petri film plating. So you would need pipettes um, or like one of those one male pipette eyedroppers and then a steady hand, I guess, to, to do these. But um, we use them at Escarpment for um, some homebrew stuff. So we have um, McConkie agar ones to test for E. coli. So if we're using like raw water or something weird, or we also use it to test for our uh, DLC projects where um, waterborne or pathogenic bacteria could exist. Um, that's a little bit besides the point. You probably wouldn't use that. You would want one of these two. So this one uh, specifically helps with yeast, um, plating yeast, and the other one is for lactic acid bacteria. These are not as good as actual agar plating because they're not differential. Uh, you can't really make um, claims on like cross-contamination or anything like that, but um, you can use it to check to see if yeast or bacteria is somewhere in your process that it shouldn't be. So it can be used to confirm, for example, um, that your filter process is working, that there's no yeast or bacteria after your filter when you're putting your product together. So neat idea. Um, the best part about these is they're shelf stable. So our, like they have a really long expiry date. They can sit at room temperature. Uh, you get 50 plates in a little box that's about this big. Um, yeah, they don't take up much space. You just put like, it's like this little cardboard sheet. You like roll it back, you put your sample on, you roll your sheet back down, and then that can just incubate at room temperature. 25 degrees is better, but room temperature, and you just kind of follow the instructions of the plate, but it's, it's a pretty good indicator of if something's going wrong in your process. And this kind of takes us to our last test that we can really do without a lab. Um, and this is just to determine if your wart is contaminated through any of your process. So you can kind of test the wart at the very end if you wanted to, but that's kind of not what we're recommending. Um, to do this, you will need sterile um, sample containers. So whether that's a mason jar that's autoclaved, um, Pyrex glass that you autoclave. Um, we also can buy 
sometimes we buy these sterile uh, sample um, what are they called? They're specimen jars. Um, you can get that on Uline. You can get that through Fisher. Anywhere you're getting um, scientific supplies, they should sell them. They're pre-sterilized, and you can just add your sample straight to them. Um, it, this test is most useful to identify where contamination in your process um, could exist. So testing wort pre and post heat exchanger, for example, to see if the issue uh, that you're getting is from organisms in your heat exchanger. Uh, so it's more of a targeted test. That's where it's really useful, and that's better than just testing it at the end. Um, something to note for this one, too, is that you would want to take your samples aseptically. I know that's um, something mentioned a lot in general for you know presentations, webinars, anything to do with quality, but it doesn't always make sense as to what that is. Um, so this is a little slide as an aside on aseptic techniques. It refers to using procedures and practices to reduce the chances of unwanted organisms from contaminating your sample when collecting them or you know, using them and plating them. Uh, to reduce this, um, you should have a sanitized environment um, and try to keep it sanitized. At minimum, in a brewery, you should sanitize your ports and work surfaces with isopropanol and wear gloves to reduce the exposure time. Sorry. Um, but if you can, a propane Bunsen burner, like that little gift that's going off on the side, would be best. You can also use a propane torch, just be careful. Um, what they, what those do is when it's pointed up, sorry, it creates like an updraft so that, um, basically nothing can fall into your sample. It gets pushed away from your sample. So it just kind of keeps the, the sample opening, um, uh, free of debris and, and contamination. Um, so instead of referencing Mary Pelletieri for a lot of this information that I found, um, on the bottom of the slide where no one's actually going to read it or, or care. Um, I thought I'd give her a little bit of a shout out because I listened to her um, chat on Beersmith or her, her podcast, um, episode 120. It's on quality management in beer. It's actually very good. So I highly recommend it. The link's at the bottom. Um, it was a good 45 minutes. Uh, so in summary for topic one, there's some pretty great tests you can complete without a lab, um, but there's always more information you can get from a basic lab, uh, sorry, basic lab with a microscope, humicitometer, and some slides. Um, if it's not possible, you should definitely consider some or all of the tests that are illustrated in this uh, webinar. Um, again, my take home message, keep a log of every result that you do. If you conduct a test, record those results. So topic two is test with the lab, but like nothing fancy. Um, another aside before we even get into that, um, the focus of this presentation is tests you can do without a lab. That was the idea behind it. But as we were writing it, we kind of were like, it's it's fine to do that. But even to do a lot of the tests, you need to get some equipment in. Um, and at that point, if you just get some basic lab equipment in, um, you can do so many more tests that are so useful to your product consistency and your cleaning processes. Um, so this next section is to just uh, highlight how much information you can actually collect with really, really basic tests. And um, uh, if anyone attended the last webinar with Chris um, on cell counting, we, we discussed how their decent microscopes and hemocytometers can cost you combined less than $500. Um, so hopefully this talk by the end will encourage you to take some baby steps to improve your quality control regime and at a minimum encourage you to keep better product records. This is a quick breakdown of um, setting up a basic lab with basic equipment. And again, I'm referring to a small lab as basically like a closet with um, a microscope, very basic plating capabilities, even if you're using those 3M Petri film plates um, and record keeping. So for a decent one, um, really basic setup, 1200 bucks. And if you're losing that same IPA um, that Chris mentioned his uh, with the hops adjusted to $1,000 for, for hops uh, instead of $100, uh, you're sitting at 4,000 bucks. So uh, it's not a, it's not as big of an investment as I think some people think it is, but I, I mean, it certainly is still money that you'll have to, you'll have to justify, um, if it works for your lab. Um, so this is the last slide on, on my little tangent on the importance of a lab, I promise. Um, with some fairly affordable equipment and supplies, you can have a lab. Um, all you need to do is conduct cell counts, uh, visualize your yeast health and plate samples and all the equipment on the previous slide is enough to get you there, as well as perform quick bacterial ID, which is what we're going to go into 
depth event to show you additional tests you can do without anything fancy um, that are super powerful. So uh, we call it internally quick bacterial ID. This is what we do when we find a bacterial contamination, whether for, it's for a client or it's for uh, us in our homebrew or for one of our products, um, and we need to investigate it prior to PCR. PCR is expensive, it's very specific, it takes a long time, um, but all of these tests that can give you a lot of information combined take less than 10 minutes to complete, um, and they're really cheap to have up and running. So if you vis visually see bacteria, um, ideally through plating, these are some tests that you can do. So you can interpret those plate results um, to see what the growth pattern is and the characteristics of the bacteria growing on the plate, as well as perform a potassium hydroxide test, a hydrogen peroxide test. Um, I look at it under the microscope. So 40 times, or sorry, 400 times uh, magnified should be more than enough. Sometimes you might have to go up to 100, or sorry, um, 1,000 times magnification. Um, but if anyone needs help with that, we have like little quick tips on how to do that too. And then the oxidase test. The oxidase test, if you're not going to perform any of these tests, it's the oxidase one. It is the most expensive um, and sort of gives you the least amount of information, but I'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, and all of these tests combined give you all the information you need, really, to narrow down uh, the bacterial contamination to the species level. Um, and then that will help you identify in your cleaning process where it's basically harboring or living because certain bacteria in brewing like certain equipment and temperature ranges and, and process things. So um, as an example, this is our plating quality control regime at Escarpment Labs. So we plate onto three media, um, but have four conditions. Um, so the first one is WON in this bottom corner. This is to see what yeast cross contamination looks like if we have any and to also confirm yeast uniformity and health. Um, LCSM here is this kind of coppery one because it contains copper. Um, and we use it as our diastatic yeast screen. And it's in air quotes because it's extremely good if you get to know your yeast, um, but some wild yeast will grow on it even if they are diastatic negative, which I'm sure Richard will go into in Diastatic 101. Um, and then the last two here are MRS plates. Um, and these are specific for lactic acid producing bacteria. Um, and then we condition them aerobically and anaerobically or with oxygen and without oxygen um, to promote growth and see if anything's in that sample. Um, each brewery will have different plating requirements. So if you're not dealing with any diastatic strains, you probably wouldn't need LCSM, um, for example. But uh, even plating on those Petri film plates probably would work for this. Uh, we haven't done that. But as long as you get a colony on that film, um, you should be able to do any of these tests. So step one, interpreting the plate results. So if you actually look on our little sample of MRS here, this is MRS plus, so it didn't grow on MRS minus. Um, and it's these little flat white colonies. So you would record that down on your, your little product record or scrap piece of paper that you're gonna be writing everything down on to document your tests. Um, bacteria is pretty easy to identify. Pretty much anything growing on MRS is bacteria. Um, there are weird cases, but almost all the time it's bacteria. They appear gloopy, shiny, wet, um, and they're usually flat, whereas yeast is nice and rounded, matte. Um, they just kind of look pretty, I don't know. Um, and then other there's other little tips and tricks. So WLN has a dye in it, and when um, acid-producing bacteria are on it, in one day, pretty much, it can convert that whole blue plate to yellow, like a neon yellow. So it's a pretty quick indicator as well if you have bacteria. Um, so when you're interpreting, interpreting those plate results, especially on your MRS, you can classify them as aerobic, anaerobic, or both. That's the easiest way to do it. Um, they have all these fancy names and terms. So obligate aerobe means that it only grows with oxygen. Um, so it'll only grow on your MRS plus. Obligate anaerobe, very similar, um, only grows aerobically without oxygen. So you'd find that on your MRS minus, and then you have facultative aerobes and facultative anaerobes, and that's basically they both grow on both. So they'll grow aerobically and anaerobically, um, but one might have more growth than the other, and that's kind of how you can classify those ones. This brings us to our potassium hydroxide test. Um, so you can buy this online uh, through Fisher Scientific or Sigma or whoever. You want a 3.5% solution. 
uh, and this is a replacement for a gram stain, uh, or it tests for gram negative bacteria. Uh, so gram staining is kind of difficult. You have to heat fix your uh, solution of bacteria onto a, uh, a slide, visualize it, stain it, and do all this work. This is a chemical one. It is basically a yes or no as well, um, and it's, it takes up to 30 seconds. So uh, gram positive cells have this big, thick peptidoglycan wall, and gram negative ones have a much thinner peptidoglycan wall, and KOH is able to penetrate thin peptidoglycan walls, but not thick ones. So when it uh, penetrates the gram negative wall, um, it releases the DNA, it lyses that cell open, DNA, uh, DNA inherently has a stringy property to it. So if it does work and it's a successful positive result, um, you'll put your, your uh, pipette tip or toothpick or inoculation loop into that little bit of slurry. And then if it strings up like it does in this picture, it's a positive result and you have a gram negative bacteria. To do that test, all you do is add five microliters of your KOH um, and then one of the colonies off the plate swirl them around and you're done. And that's a yes or no. You write that on your little scrap piece of paper with all the uh, characteristics from the plating. Hydrogen peroxide test. We buy our hydrogen peroxide at Shoppers Drug Mart uh, for $4.99. Um, this test is used to determine if the bacteria possess a specific enzyme called catalase, which is typically found in aerobic organisms. So this differentiates aerobes from obligate anaerobes. Um, Basically, all it does is this enzyme converts the H2O2 into its elements again, which is water and oxygen, and that process causes bubbles. So this is almost instantaneous. It's again, five microliters of uh, hydrogen peroxide, one colony from the plate, and it's usually within seconds you get bubbling like that. So um, it's another good test, very quick. <clears throat> and we just do these on microscope slides like they show in these pictures. So sometimes we'll even do the KOH test on one side, write on it with an ethanol marker, and then um, do the, the hydrogen peroxide test right next to it. Uh, the last one really, last one really, um, is our microscope check where you're looking for morphology. Uh, this is specifically just looking at the shape. Um, so is it rod shaped, cockeye shaped, or spiral shaped? Uh, spiral shaped, in my opinion, Richard can comment later, uh, is rare. I, we typically don't see it. I think it's mostly waterborne. Um, sometimes mold looks spirally, but um, most brewing bacteria um, appear cocci or bacilli or rod shaped. Um, you're also trying to look here to see if they form in pairs, tetrads, chains, or if they're found all by themselves floating around. Again, write everything down. Keep a little check mark list of all your tests, um, write down all your results because uh, you're going to need them in a minute. <clears throat> and then, so this is our oxidase test. Um, so we use our oxidase tests when we have narrowed it down based on all the other tests to two organisms. And out of those two organisms, one of them is oxidase positive and one of them is oxidase negative. We'll conduct the test to see which one it is. These tests are more expensive. Uh, it's definitely the most expensive out of all the tests, but it's still not insane. Um, and truthfully, there's not a lot of oxidase positive bacteria in the brewing industry or that you can really encounter. Um, so we, we use this a little bit sparingly, but all you do is the oxidase test is coated on one end with a, um, chemical. Don't ask me what the chemical is. It's extremely long. I have it written down. Someone does ask, but it's, I can't even pronounce it. Um, and that chemical reacts with the cytochrome C oxidase enzyme. Um, and it turns purple, or some of them are pink, depending on the manufacturer. But um, it's a really fancy test to determine uh, if this specific organism can use oxygen to breathe in a specific respiratory, uh, respiratory process, um, which is really beyond uh, even like my background in biochem. So, <clears throat> um, okay, great. So we've done all these tests. We have all this random information. What are we going to do with it? Straight up, you can put it into Google. Just put in your results. So say your organism grew only on MRS plus, so not MRS minus, saying it's an obligate aerobe. It appears shiny and gloopy, catalase positive, gram negative. Um, type some of that into Google and follow it up with the word beer. So I did that. 
Gram positive, catalase positive, obligate arrow, beer. First article is from ResearchGate, so not a terrible um, reference, I guess. And the first thing, first line says acetobacter and gluconobacter, which is true. It's characteristic of, of those bacteria. Um, this test would have taken, all of these tests would have taken under 10 minutes. And now you know exactly what you're dealing with in terms of um, bacteria. To figure out where it is in your facility will be a little bit more uh, research than just one um, Google search, but we kind of did a lot of that legwork for you if you are interested, or I should say Richard did. Richard put this together based on some research. Um, <clears throat> but so if we follow this um, and all the pink arrows are the tests that we conducted, so you know, gram negative, catalase positive, uh, we knew our oxygen tolerance from the plates and our <coughs> sorry, our colony morphology, we can kind of narrow it down to this part of our table. Um, based on our plating, so we plated on MRS, which this last column is, is kind of an escurvin lab specific thing where we've plated things on plates and, see, and saw what grew. It doesn't actually grow on MRS, um, so it can't be any of these two bottom ones. So even using this chart, we've narrowed it down to acetobacter and gluconobacter from these tests in our scort morphology. Um, but what's nice about this that we've included is it tells you the typical source of where you might find this contamination in your brewery. Um, so acetobacter and gluconobacter are very similar organisms in general. So the, a lot of, almost all of their information is identical. Um, but um, they are typically found in your headspace or oxygen ingress, heat exchangers, hard pipes, and packaging or rinse water. So it's like not in your CO2 lines, it's probably not in your yeast. Um, that kind of stuff. So you can use this to really hone in on specific areas in your brewery to clean better or, or improve CIP processes or identify um, potential issues uh, instead of kind of figuring out like where, where did this come from and having no idea. So in summary, um, you, there's a lot of tests you can do without a lab, but you can really only go so far without having lab equipment or basic lab, um, yeah, basic lab equipment really. Um, there are a few simple tests you can do downstream of plating, um, but honestly, plating is like the best thing you can possibly do to just get uh, visual insight into your beer and the health of it. Um, but certain tests can help you overlook, um, uh, can help you improve processes of CIPing if they were previously overlooked, um, and help you improve product quality. Labs don't need to be fancy or expensive. They can be really small, like a desk, like I said earlier, with a, a microscope in a closet with a couple shelves to hold your chemicals, um, decent lighting. Um, but whatever you do, regardless of whatever test you take home to your brewery, um, make sure that you record those results in a book or online or on a database somewhere. Um, and the more tests you do, the higher your quality standards will be and you can adhere to those new standards and make consistent products. That's kind of all I have to say today. Um, so hopefully that was fine for a no lab suggesting we should get a lab presentation. <laughs> Did that work? Is this, are we all back to normal? <laughs> <laughs> can you just see me now? Yeah. Yeah, we can see you now. Okay. Are we back to normal? Fine? We're uh, not back to normal. There is no normal anymore, Chris. I know, I know. We're not back. But anyway, no. This but that is, went fine. I that couldn't was, see anybody. That, I couldn't. Fucking read anything. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> that went really well. Um, uh, so the take-home messages are really record the stuff you learn about your beer. You're going to see trends over time, and also having some basic lab stuff is is pretty important. And um, yes, you can do some very rudimentary tests, but um, the small investment in uh, microscope and some plating materials would really go a long way uh, for the quality of your beer. So that seems yeah, to be the it's huge. Yeah. Um, Evan's here. Evan. Wave, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Alex, we didn't get a lot of questions. Okay, and cool. I think this. That's nice. Yeah, on, honestly, I <laughs> think this really speaks. <laughs> <laughs> I think this speaks more to our audience. Our audience are like watching these uh, these webcasts over the few la last couple of weeks. There's a very knowledgeable audience out there. It's, people know what they're yeah. talking about. Um, so yeah, so we didn't get too many questions, but here we go. 
what are your thoughts on the use of an ATP meter in the brewery? Uh, expense, expen uh, sorry, excessive spending for just a quantitative and non-specific result? Question mark. Uh, yeah. So yeah. we, when I first started, we were testing out different ATP monitors to see how they worked um, and to see which one was like kind of the most efficient. We ended up settling on we didn't really like it, <laughs> um, as far as I remember. So yeah, you get a lot of false positives. Um, they are a little finicky. They're very expensive. Um, Personally, I feel like if you just are really good about your cleaning and your CIP processes and you validate those, you can kind of get away without an ATP meter. Um, and, and the ATP meter is kind of just like a yes or go, yes or no test anyways. Like it's a yes, there was um, organisms found or, or whatever it measures, I don't even remember, but yes, it's on this surface, you should clean it. So it's like... In my opinion, I don't think it's the best, but you know, I think with increases in traceability coming up, um, it might be some sort of mandated test that whether it's you know great or not, we might actually have to follow. So, um, again, I, I don't have much experience actually using the ATP meter. Um, it was so expensive, we just like it was like given to one person and one person only. So, um, that's kind of my answer. Uh, I'm sure that there's going to be different suggestions in the comments or something but <laughs> yeah um, you yeah. might be able to speak to that too i'm sure you had to use atp meters in your brewing career um yeah so it's definitely like i'm seeing the comments uh it's good for validating your cleaning processes so you just want to check if there's any organic material left on any of your surfaces after doing your caustic uh wash um it is mandated in some i know some areas like I know the BRC, like you must uh, okay. ATP swab, even for breweries, they have to ATP swab their surfaces. So who knows, they may be creeping like, you know, like I know they're going to start making, we keep hearing about how they're going to tighten up regulatory, um, uh, you know, they're going to get more stringent with rules with us. So mm -hmm. we may see that we have to give in and get an ATP meter anyway. But it's a very yeah. quick test to validate your yeah. cleaning, your, your cleaning methods for sure. Cool. Okay. Um, Okay, so there was a question about sheets. If our sheets will be, uh, will the presentation sheets of this presentation be, be available somewhere? So all of our, um, all of these uh, talks get posted to YouTube. Yep. Um, so you can check them out and watch them again later. Um, Richard put a link to, I know there was a lot of interest in that bacterial ID yeah, sheet. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> so yeah, so, so Richard put a, a link to um, where that came from or where that was developed from. So it's yeah. super informative. That's a, I rely on that sheet. It's a wonderful I sheet. I love having it. I use it all the time. It. No, I know. It's really great. Um, I'm happy um, to send that yeah. out to anybody too if they email me wanting it. Um, it it's super handy. It's really great, but it is, it's really only good if you can actually do those tests. Otherwise, it's just a list of um organisms and where they might be so like right um yeah i'm happy to give those out if they if everyone does or anyone does want that specifically though you can email me fantastic okay question uh this is this is kind of out of scope but uh so maybe this is a, a bit off topic but what about oxidation due to paa um some say that it's real others says say that paa introduces molecular oxygen and not dissolved oxygen so um yes like you know like Yes, there could be oxidation due to P PAA. Um, I think you just have to be, oh, sorry, I should let you answer this. No, 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 <laughs> I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. I, <laughs> no, I, just, I was like, I don't. <laughs> it, it can happen, I guess, but it is, you know, like it's uh, it's widely accepted as a um, as a sanita sanit sanitation agent. And um, uh, I think it's, you know, people that have used it and you're checking for dissolved oxygen after packaging, it's all, everything's all cool and not seeing major oxidation, uh, detrimental oxidation from that. Okay. Um, epoxy resin at, for a bench top, is it okay for a lab bench looking for a nice cleanable surface? Any recommendations on a lab bench? Uh, what, I don't even know what an epoxy resin would be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be quite honest. So for our lab benches, we, we bleach them once a week. Ours are stainless steel, but you know, even working in um, a research lab on campus at the university, uh, our process was to once, twice a week, bleach it um, using a diluted, I think it's one in five bleach solution, don't quote me, but uh, a, just a diluted bleach solution, freshly made. 
Um, and then um, between any sort of lab work you're doing, between strains, uh, just constantly isopropanol, uh, the benchtop surface. Um, that's that's our, and you know, water is really a great solvent to get off caked on yeast or any sort of chemicals. So water, isopropanol, and then the occasional bleach should get rid of a lot. Um, Louisa? Okay, <laughs> I don't cool. know, that's my yeah. answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we got one last question here. So mm -hmm. any considerations on media preparation for detection of contaminants? This is a, this is a big question to answer. So there's many ways yeah, to go. Cool. I'm going to open that because I want to just read it. Uh, on media preparation for detection of contaminations. So you're talking about making your own media in-house? I'm assuming that's I'm what the question is asking. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we used to make, like, I mean, we still make media in-house. Um, we used to, before we had any fancy equipment, uh, make it next to a Bunsen burner. So we would, uh, you know, you order the solution, uh, pre-mixed powders from whoever supplies them. So there's Weber Scientific, they supply LCSM, um, HLP, uh, Sigma Aldrich does MRS and WLN, and I think Fisher does one of the ones we use, maybe not. Um, but you, you, you order in your chemicals, uh, order in your powders, follow their instructions. And then what we used to do was have a Bunsen burner uh, face mask, like uh, just an N95 or, or sort of like anything, any sort of face mask, uh, gloves, sanitized surface. So it was bleached, isopropanol, and then with the burner going, just hand pour uh, agar, let it sit for a little while. It sits usually for two days to cure, and then um, it's ready to go. So you can do that. We also, like, I mean, we found out that that was like a huge pain, um, especially for the amount we were going through. So we got fancy equipment. So we actually make, make plates. If you're looking to test out plates, it's a good idea to maybe order some from us, see what those are like. And then if you're doing a higher volume, switch over to making them yourself. Louisa? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there was a follow-up question, I think, along the same lines as in Brazil, it's very difficult and expensive to get these differential medias. Uh, do you have any recommendations on other media that could do similar, a similar kind of thing? All right. Yeah. So that um, it? that's it. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Someone who's looking for uh, help on differential media. Like, I don't know. Do you have any tips on that? Like, for less expensive? Because they are very expensive to buy the, the powders. I guess I if actually you're a can't hear you anymore. Something happened. Oh, no. <laughs> so it's the same <laughs> issue is like, if anyone was listening to the previous one, I clicked a button and now everything's dead. And I'm like, oh my God, this is ending soon. <laughs> so I'll just leave it. But uh, uh, yeah, if you were, I think you were saying, like, do I have anything else to add? Okay, no, go for I it. I have nothing else to add. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. This is all I have to say. <laughs> all right, no problem. No worries. So, again, th so, everyone, uh, thanks I for. Can, I can just hop in. So, there is an option right. for. Cool. Um, an option thanks for. A, a thanks for listening. I guess. I don't this just, is so funny. Yeah. <laughs> this is so funny. Alex can't hear us at all. Um, if you're looking to make. No, Alex, you're still on camera. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right, sorry, I had to boot him. Um, okay, so there's this question about uh, it's dif uh, difficult to get these differential medias. Um, if you can't get access to those, you can go to the simpler media that other people typically use. Um, I guess the one that you can, that's like a really common one is universal beer agar. Something to remember is uh, those typically don't have, uh, they don't have any differential things to them. So you'll have to work off of yeast morphologies, which will uh, require figure, like knowing your yeast a lot more and knowing what to expect. Um, those do work, they aren't great, um, but they are a solution. And as someone mentioned, uh, doing like a ward agar or a universal beer agar with an, uh, antibiotics such as cyclohexamide can help you manage that um, and develop a program that while you don't have access to the fancier media, such as LCSM and WLN, um, that uh, can be something that works. And I don't know if Alex mentioned it, uh, setting up an anaerobic chamber can be quite simple. Uh, our anaerobic chamber is a, um, it's a, a corny keg that we just purge with CO2. So there can be some low cost uh, tools for this. So 
Um, and yeah, uh, HLP is one that you can get. Uh, doesn't require any fancy setups, and uh, it's the, the compounds it contains make it anaerobic. Um, this is all mentioned. Uh, I mentioned earlier the episode forty-five of the MBA podcast is a really good one that talks about setting up a quality lab. So I'd uh, highly suggest checking that one out. Um, and yeah, I think that's I think that's it. All right, cool. Thanks for jumping in, Chris. No problem. That was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, that's it for No Lab, No Problem today. So we have another talk coming up at 2 p.m. It's Diastaticus 101. I believe that's with Richard and Nate. Um, so we'll see you back here. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>